This is, a, this is a panel that I started doing um, about two years ago at New York Comic Con and wanted to just test it out here, see how it went, and um, just sort of talk about what it means to be a, a, a black creative person and, and the things that we're doing, especially in the era now when they, when they label stuff, right? Because like I'm old enough that I was an Afropunk before they called us Afropunks and I was a blur before it was cool to be a blur when you were just the kid that got a wedgie on the playground and they tried to beat you up but no one could beat me up because I'm the same size now as I was when I was in high school. So, um, so my name is David F. Walker and I'm a writer, I write comics and I'm just going to go down the, um, down the line and have each uh, the panelists that are here right now introduce themselves because I found that they always do that better than I do. So we will actually Start all the way down on the end. Jamar. Let me just see. Okay, okay I'll, I'll start. Hi, uh, I'm Jamar Nicholas, uh, Philadelphia native. Ooh. 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 That, that's a that very Philadelphian response. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, born and bred here. Uh, I am a cartoonist and an educator. Uh, my newest book, Leon Protected the Playground, is out, and I just won the Dwayne McDuffie Award for Diversity. Uh, for um, so my name is Anango Lumumba Kasango. Um, I'm also a producer and rapper who goes by the name Samus. And I'm a PhD candidate at Cornell University in the Science and Technology Studies Department. So I kind of split my time between being a musician and crying over my dissertation. <laughs> And I'm based out of Philadelphia, but I'm originally from upstate New York. Yeah, and, um, I'm Michael Dennis, uh, aka Mike D. I am the founder of Real Black. Uh, we promote films locally uh, through a monthly screening series, but uh, I guess I'm best known. At this point, I have a YouTube channel. We're about to, if you subscribe now, we would literally cross 200,000 views today. So please do that, but uh, best known for being yelled at by Dick Gregory for six hours. So uh, that's a claim to fame, but we promote black film, black culture, and black consciousness, everything that I do, everything real black. And like I said, my name is David Walker. I'm not from Philly. Um, I'm a writer. I write for Marvel. I write for DC. Uh, in January, I've got a book, a graphic novel coming out from Random House. Uh, uh, the biography of Frederick Douglass, and uh, that's about the most important thing. Everything else is pales in comparison. So, um, so I just want to get it, get it started and, and sort of talk about. Uh, there's a really interesting phenomenon going on. I think we've probably all noticed it. Like, have you? How many of you have been invited to talk about Black Panther? Like, all of a sudden, Black Panther has legitimized what we've been doing in, in every single facet, right? Whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's film. Um, and it's, it's sort of interesting because it's like all of a sudden we've been discovered, but we've been doing this stuff for a long time. So I want to talk about, you know, your feelings about where we've come from in terms of the, the, the individual art that you do and how you express yourself. and how you fit into the larger landscape. Does that make sense? Because I've been up since 2.30 this morning, so. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, do, we, do we need these? Yeah. Okay, then we need these. Um, well, I guess I'll start uh, just coming from my angle of being a cartoonist with a cartoony style. Uh, if you're familiar with my work, it looks like um, I went to school for animation. I have a cartoony style that's not uh, realistic, with whatever that means, and you know, uh, I find myself in a lane as far as how people interpret what they're into when they walk through the aisles of a comic book convention. If you're a fan of kind of like the Marvel style of work, and you know, luckily for us, in the past 10, 15, 20 years, you see more indie artists uh, penetrate the mainstream style, like Scotty is a perfect example. Um, so when you come to things like, well, this is a, going back to your Black Panther thing, just thinking about that, right before the movie came out, um, one of the local news bodies hit me up on Twitter 
and I don't know, I guess it just went down the line. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure how I fit into the Black Panther premiere, but they were like, hey, Mr. Nicholas, we'd like to interview you about Black Panther, and I was at my day job, so I didn't see it. So I got back to them and was like, oh, uh, sure, hit me up. Sorry, no longer needed. It didn't, like, disconnected me from Facebook. They unfollowed me. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes me feel amazing. Thank you. But, you know, so, like, the connection of people being interested in the craft or the industry has been interesting, but I don't really know how much it's sticking. You know what I mean? Like, do you, you know, it's, oh, I know a black guy who does comics. Let me ask him about Black Panther is kind of where, you know, I come in. Well, I think that at this point we're all sort of that either that black guy, that right. black gal, right. or that black non-binary, right. you know, individual. So, right. yeah, Sam, is it you? Yeah, I think it's it's been really um, both exciting but also frustrating. The reason I've already been, I think, addressed um, exciting, and that of course you have all these new eyes and ears um, who are kind of like uh, you know primed to to engage with the stuff you all kind of been doing for some time now, so that's really exciting. Um, but I think one of the anxieties that I have is that as, you know, as folks see that this is like profitable, right, as this becomes subsumed <laughs> into, you know, capitalist structures, it's like the kind of political consciousness that I think is at the heart of a lot of um, the dialogues that the folks on the stage have been having is sort of erased, or even in my experience as a, um, I've been been put into this category of nerdcore hip hop, which I've like vehemently resisted <laughs> for years and years and years, but I keep being every time there's an article published, nerdcore artist, nerdcore artist, that, and part of why I wanted to reject that term was because I felt like a lot of the other nerdcore artists were white guys who could not rap and were parodying this art form that I actually was like deeply in love with. Um, and so that's, that's been this challenge of having my work and an artist like Jim Gray have also spoken about this, but being put into this categorization that doesn't at all sort of fit the kind of breadth of what you're talking about because it's like easy and neat and has some sort of momentum around it. So yeah, it's a challenge in both ways. Yeah, I, this, this is interesting to me because I'm, I'm trying to gauge the artists. Usually I speak at film festivals and, and the dialogue is about black film and independence and working within the mainstream or working independently. The release of Black Panther, 2018 generally, I think, I, I like to say this is the, con the year of the convergence for, for black film and it's fantastic in the sense that um, there's so many platforms and outlets for expression and, and um, the monster needs to be fed, so um, uh, in this age of oppression, or at least we're, we're woke-ish, to quote uh, Marlon, I think there's, there's a lot of interest in this, uh, it frustrates me that uh, a lot, for, from a black standpoint, I think we take ownership of a lot of things that we don't own, and I think that that's, that's the issue I have with it. But, um, a lot of people are getting work, and, and yeah, I hope uh, as our, I, you know, we've seen these cycles. I feel like what's happening now in film with black filmmakers is sort of what happened 20, 30 years ago in hip hop, where you had a lot of independent voices, suddenly it's commodified, yeah. and now we're being brought into the mainstream. So you know, a lot of my energy is just about trying to remind people again what the political roots are, what it really means, as opposed to what the compromises that have to be made in order to make a, a Disney vehicle with some black leads in it happen. Um, and hopefully the information that we're sharing uh, maintains people's integrity because I, I just don't want what I feel the, the mountain has been to turn into what rap has become. I don't want to see a bunch of mumble rapping filmmakers 20 years from now. So, so I'm glad you're here and I'm, I'm glad we're sharing this. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, by the time something gets a label that becomes mainstream, hip-hop is a great example of that, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, they, they weren't calling it hip-hop, and but then it got a name, that name caught on, and then it became commodified. And and so when I call this panel Macro Punks and Words, a lot of it is a play on that commodification. Um, and, and there's artists existing in the trenches doing what we're doing, in some cases for decades. And, and, but then it's suddenly like, oh, 
we've just discovered you, so now you're legitimate, right? You know, you know, it doesn't matter how many books you put out, it doesn't matter how many film festivals you've done, or film festivals you've made, concerts you've played, or albums you've recorded. And it's, it's just sort of interesting, because I, I feel like um, with this year, this year being a, a monumental year in terms of just the amount of money that this movie, this one particular movie generated for the biggest multimedia corporation in the world, does not make what we do any more legitimate. It just makes it more crucial that we keep doing what we do and don't get sort of diluted, or diluted, I should say, um, watered down. Um, what are some of the things out there that you're seeing now, and, and it doesn't have to be within the medium that you're working in, that inspires you, that keeps you going, that's, that we can share with, with, with people. So it's like, because it, it's funny, like I was invited to San Francisco the next month, and they, they want me to talk about Black Panther. And I keep telling them, I've never worked on Black Panther, I've never, <laughs> never written, I've never even had Black Panther make a cameo in a comic I've written. And they're like, that doesn't matter. And I'm like, no, it, it really kind of does. Because I have very valuable things to say. So I'm just gonna have to fly me out. I'm gonna be like, okay, so I'm here to talk about Black Panther, but not really. Let's talk about the Black Panthers instead. <laughs> so what are some of the things that are inspiring you that keep you, because uh, for me, it, sometimes it feels almost, um, it's, it, it's some, it, sometimes it feels disheartening. It's like, oh, this movie just crossed a billion dollars. Well, we're lost now because, because everyone's gonna be looking to get us to sell out. In terms of, I guess, things that, um, so the question was, what, what do we do to... Well, well, you know, what's, what's inspiring? What's, what's inspiring? What's something out there that, that, that you gravitate towards that helps keep you grounded yeah. as the big machines of Disney and Comcast and all those are trying to suck the souls out of us and the dollars out of our pockets? Yeah, so I think um, going back to what I was saying around this term nerdcore, one thing that I started, or one kind of um, idea slash movement um, that I started gravitating towards was ideas around Afrofuturism. Um, and I, I started to look into folks who um, were invested in the term and all the sort of offshoots around it. And so there were a number of artists that I think are really important and incredible. One of them is an MC slash producer slash kind of noise artist named War Mother, actually based out of Philadelphia, but she's like international. She follow her on Instagram, she's in London, and she's over in Berlin, and she's in, in Philadelphia for you know, two days. She does jazz, she does everything. Um, but she's also sort of a very like uh, prominent voice in terms of pushing back against systems of power. Like she's very, she's very critical in the work that she does. She has an Afrofuturist collective where they think about challenging time or ways to, to push back against you know things like gentrification in the city. So um, I think following folks who have their feet on the ground and seeing kind of what they're they're up to is the thing that that has kept me kind of energized, like seeing folks who are really out there doing it and who have not compromised in any any regard. And in particular, I think we're having this, this amazing renaissance um, around black women MCs. There are so many black women who are who have been rapping for some time but are now getting that shine that I think they deserve. No Name just put out a project. Uh, Jean Grey put out a project this year. So there are a number of folks that we can keep looking to who have been doing this for, for forever and have never once kind of compromised. Um, and that's something that keeps giving me kind of joy. Uh, one thing that I'm uh, really excited about right now is kind of like the push of black uh, academia into the comments. Uh, uh, our good friends John Jennings and Damian Duffy uh, just put out this wonderful book called Black Comics Returns. I don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, you should pick it up. I actually have some on my table back upstairs. But, um, what is and will you sell them to us? Uh, I have a couple of them. Um, so what's really amazing about this book, and this is the second, uh, it's almost like a reference coffee table book, and it's chock full of um, independent black comic or illustrator, comic creators, uh, creatives, who are making waves in the industry, but you may not be familiar with them. Um, I've seen people uh, pick up a book like this and kind of use it as kind of like a, la a laundry list. 
like, oh, I have never seen this style before, but let me go find this guy and check him out. Uh, and like I said about John and Damien, uh, they just won uh, Eisner for their uh, adaptation of Kid Octavia Butler's Kindred, which is amazing. Um, this kind of play into kind of like the higher education and them doing books on a level that people used to, like I used to talk about people who were professors who had comic books in their collection, or they really like comics, but now we have courses on comic book discourse. And if and I don't want to look at this as legitimizing what we do because I feel like we're legitimate already, but the fact that there's some kind of like academic uh, push behind it kind of makes us shine a little brighter, and I'm loving that movement right now. I I I'm not that smart. Wow, I'm just, I don't even know. Um, I I watch a lot of YouTube. I don't know. Um, uh, you know Jesse Lee Peterson. You know, I, I'm killing my brain, but um, but what you said triggered something in, in my mind. It's like I I feel like when when you, this is an interesting time because yeah, you have a comic book that has catapulted. Oh, Show Enough is here. Um, show Enough. Show Enough. I I admire your work. Um, you the baddest mofo low down this side of town. Okay. I need to take your picture when this is over. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think as Afro punks and blurs, we we were always attracted to the fringe and the outside. And and I I remember those days like when you discover an artist and and um, they're your artist and all of a sudden they end up on Senate Live and everybody's talking about them like and then you start to feel like their work is a little compromised and then they're not you're, they're not your favorite anymore. You know, I don't see that happening with these comic books because people. There's such a property people have been following for 30, 40 years, and now it seems like there's a, this insatiable need to see re-renderings of Luke Cage and all this stuff. And I think it gives us power when we see the success of this. But, um, you know, it's hard for me to think. I mean, because I've known some of these, like the Ryan Coogler from Fruit Trail Station, I really hope that, I, that he doesn't fall into the sunken place, you know, and, and just, you know, I just, I'm still rooting for these people. I believe they have the integrity. Um, but, I mean, my, to answer your question, I have the best job because whenever I have any curiosity, I can just call somebody and Skype them and interview them and have a conversation and figure out their perspective. So, uh, one, one of the blessings of it is a mutual friend of ours, um, we have uh, Charles Woods, uh, we call him a professor, he's an expert, and um, anytime something like this comes up in pop culture, we, we have a discussion about it, and um, it helps us process, and then also through the message boards and Twitter and things, I, I kind of find a resolution, but um, it changes It changes every day, but I, I guess I'm in, in my heart of hearts, I, I'm still fringe, but I, I think anybody's success is long, as it's amplifying something, it's, it's a good thing. I don't, it, it doesn't hurt me. Well, I think it's also, and what this comes down to too, is that there's, um, that there's a very long history to, uh, the, the three of you, or four of us actually, represent um, various mediums in which black people have been active for a very long time. <laughs> and, but it, it comes away, so you're, like, you're talking about Afrofuturism, you know? Well, W.E.B. Du Bois was writing stories that could be considered Afrofuturism, right? Um, so again, yeah, even before the term Afrofuturism existed, or before they went, before it was speculative fiction, when it was just science fiction, um, we've been active participants. I think what's really interesting about, as a panel, is that, um, that all of us have an understanding of the history of what came before us, and an understanding that, and, um, I, I think it's sort of important to talk about that. I mean, where, you know, the influences that we had, and not just necessarily black artists, per se, but it's, it, you know, like in, in, in comics, um, I don't know if you, you know, well, you know who George Harriman is, right? Crazy Cat, I don't know if you know who George Harriman is, but, you know, it was one of the first comic strips in America, and George Harriman was, you know, biracial, black guy who passed for white, and it, it, this incredible history, and you know all the black cartoonists from the syndicated black newspapers, the you know the Defender and, and things like 
that. Um, so I think it's really important that as, as we move forward and look at the future, that we don't forget where we came from in our past. And uh, you know, that's not really a question there, it's more of a statement, but I don't know if any of you want to elaborate on that, because part of what I find myself having to do is, is break down the history of people. You know, what came before? What came before Get Out? You know, what came before? <laughs> Oh, I, I'll jump. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I should mention, since we're in Philly, um, a lot of the filmmakers that I admire that are doing great work that you should investigate have shown work at the Black Star Film Festival. And right now, um, you know, Terrence Nance, Random Acts of Flyness, is one of the most groundbreaking shows out there. But I also like Last OG and, you know, this Jordan Peele's Monkey Paw, every, you know, there, there are people that have gotten, and Ava DuVernay certainly, have gotten a certain level of power that understand the history and are seeking to create not only um, advance the, the narrative in terms of political agenda, but also create good entertainment. So, and I think that's what's needed. I think where we are now, if we're talking about the past and things are cyclical, is that I, I can't be responsible for people that just walked in and they're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, I think it's about passing the torch and leaving some breadcrumbs. You know, and I think that's that that's the job. But there's we we've gotten through the barrier where there's only three networks or there's only one person at a time can can speak for an entire race and we have choices and and now um, it seems like in twenty eighteen everybody's making the film that they wish existed when they were younger, right? Or why aren't we speaking on this? And I think that that's great, um, but it, it may continue to marginalize us. I, I think, um, so it goes back and forth between strong political statements that only a black filmmaker can, can make, and that's how they're getting made, and then the movies that are fulfilling an agenda of inclusion. So we're seeing, like I like the show on Netflix um, with the, the kids, it sort of reminds me of like a John Hughes movie, but it's set now like LA gang culture, it's like the three kids. You, you, Somebody knows the name of it. Um, what's it called? On my block. There you go. On my block. So I think that's that's great that we're creating it, but I think we need more. What I what I love about movies is you can project your imagination anywhere. What I love about comic books is you become the characters, and I don't see us getting the budgets or people making the films yet that really project into not only the future but our imagination the same way that. Um, I've been brainwashed to look at a Tom Cruise movie and imagine I'm a short five foot four white guy. I, I want to see the black heroes and that can also um, capture white people's imagination. Wow, I, I could be that too, or that's super that's super cool. Not not that super fun crap, but I want I want to be that too. Yeah, show enough. So that's that's what I think that's where we are. Yeah, I think one of the um the reason, the, my name, Samus, I added an extra M to it because I didn't want Nintendo to sue me for the franchise. <laughs> Samus that, that owns um, that franchise. But actually, I think that story, the story of the character Samus is really powerful for thinking about this exact discussion. So for those of you that don't know, in the original Nintendo game, uh, which came out in 1986, um, the main character is in an armor suit. You can't necessarily tell what they look like. Uh, and I remember as a kid, I just assumed that this was a, a guy. Um, I don't know that I had any sort of racial identity or idea that I was thinking about, but I remember saying he to my brother. Um, and then we beat the end of the, we got to the end of the game, and the armor suit comes off, and you discover that the main character is a woman. Um, and I love the way Nintendo did this because it didn't, they didn't say surprise or gotcha. It wasn't this gotcha moment. She sort of was revealed. And then the credits came, and so you were left to think about your gendered assumptions just by yourself or whoever was in that room. And I kind of, I, I hope that that's kind of the future that, that we're headed towards, where 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 characters, where our we, we have characters and are able to speak on experiences that, like you were saying, are particularly come from a black experience, but also uh, kind of don't neatly map just onto the, our black identities. That there's like a fluidity there. Um, that's like my hope, and I think that. Samus is like my, my dream for, for how black characters are understood, black music and black forms of expression. Well, hang on, I love, I love what you're saying. I mean, it made me think, like, I, the, the, I, like I said, I don't come to the, many of these, but 
what I love about video games and, and all this stuff is you become the character, but I think when, and that's a level of escapism and fun, but film and narrative, comics, stories, the stories are what connect us to the world, and sometimes when you're just, and I think film has done us a disservice by basically becoming video games for the most part. Uh, shout out to Storm, who just walked in. Um, <laughs> And as a female Deadpool, is that what's what's going to start? Spider, Spider Man, Spider, Spider Woman, Spider Man. I, I didn't. I just I'm like high school bully kid. Um, but yeah, I mean, so so yeah, I mean, we can't we can't lose sight of story um, because that's when we we start to see ourselves and we feel something and we become more. We imagine more. So I, I hope I hope we can find another synergy. I'll kind of jump on from a, a comic strip cartoon stand, standpoint. Thinking about when I first started, um, I wanted to be a comic strip artist. Um, what it means I didn't wake up. It? <laughs> um, I wanted to be a comic strip artist, and that, if anybody knows about how comic strips are made, uh, you uh, in the past had to uh, get picked up by a syndicate and then distributed your strip across the country, and that's how your strip got in the newspaper. Um, at the time, I uh, tried to submit my very, it wasn't amazing at the time, but I can kind of see why they may not have picked it up. But a lot of my rejection letters said things like, well, we already have a black comic strip, so we don't need to. Because we're like the Highlander. Right. There can be only one. <laughs> one. <laughs> Quick um, so, and, you know, just watching kind of the, the black comic strip uh, develop, uh, kind of like Rob Armstrong's Jumpstart, um, even uh, uh, one of the biggest ones that came out in the long and since uh, maybe the last 20 years was uh, Aaron Bruce Boondocks, yeah. right? There are fans of the cartoon that didn't know it was a comic strip, right? That kind of ties into where we are with the mainstream uh, movies and superhero movies, who there are people who don't know that they were originally comic books. And just kind of seeing where that's going to now where we have web comics and the, the transportation channel has just opened up so much that you don't have to be syndicated by these guys in the tower to get your word out there. You can do web comics, you can do mini comics, you can self-publish your own stuff and get your audience that way. So as long as we Make sure that we're, you know, focusing on more than just the big two or just, you know, whatever they feed us at Marvel and DC and know that there are things out there that may connect to us better than that, then I think, you know, we're in a, we're in a good place. I'm always afraid of fans who are just like, yo, but what about Black Panther? Or what, you know, what about, you know, keep going back to Black Panther is the whipping post today. But, you know, walk through the artist alley and you'll find amazing, you know, black creators in there doing stuff, and it may be something you didn't know you wanted. Yeah, it's, it's also very interesting to me, too, because, um, you know, we, we we tend to get, fi again, fixated on, on the sort of pinnacle. Right. And, and again, that pinnacle is often, I mean, I love, I, I, I was very entertained by Black Panther, but again, it's a Disney movie, you know? And, and I think what's also interesting about what a lot of us are doing and what a lot of us are talking about is we talk about being black artists, black creators, black curators. And we use that term, it's a very catch-all term as if we're a monolithic block of people. But that even within the work that I know the four of us have done, just the four of us, sort of transcends this very narrow definition of what it means to be black. And, and, and to me, there's nothing more exciting than messing with that paradigm, right? Than messing with people's assumptions of what I'm supposed to be, and like, and, and messing with their with their game, and you know, and, I, and I, so again, it's not so much a question as it's just part of carrying on of the discussion. It's like we are so much more, and and it's about me as a creator creating things that for all those other people who feel like. Oh yeah, you know, I'm, who, who always people have always said, you know, you're, you're not like other black people. You, you speak so well. <laughs> How many of us have heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> please, please, y'all, come to have a show tonight at 7:15. I have a song called Mighty Morphine about 
that specific thing. You are so articulate. Wow. <laughs> Please, I just want to like, politic with y'all <laughs> over that. That just that alone is a whole whole panel. Um, go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, I can even just quickly speak to uh, the fact that I'm sure, David, you get this a lot. Oh, I didn't know you were black. <laughs> I love your comics. I, I didn't know you were a black guy. You know, like, no, how many times? Have, uh, oh, all the time. Well, people, people will walk up to me, and they do it all the time, especially on, in social media where they challenge you. You're, you're not black. Right. You know, tell you. and I've got that, that high yellow. Complex that, that you know that Malcolm X had and Angela Davis had, and where you get really angry because people just assume that you're Cuban or something. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if when, when you want to open this up, but it was like um, I, you know, I, I, I go, uh, I think everything is just funny sometimes. There's certain things I'm serious about, and, and I think it boils, when it comes down to the storytelling. Um, nobody's come to save black people, and there's a, there's always some little thing. They want our money. We're ha they're happy when we come and we spend our money eight nine times to go see something that is representative. But it seems like any time that somebody really tries to level it up and and seek justice in terms of telling a story, that's when the problems come. You know. So I, on one hand, I, I, I would love to get all that money that the folks are getting, but on the other hand, I, I reserve my rights to protest. And I think maybe, even if I'm not aged out of the system at this point, I, I don't know if I'm ready to jump both feet into it for, for those political reasons. Because, you know, I came up in that hip hop era, that golden age, and Holly Shuffle and Spike Lee, and there were no doors at all open in the 80s, 70s. You know, so my, my whole mentality is like, you gotta do it yourself and, and you have to maintain your integrity as an artist. But, um, you know, there's, there's room for T.I. too, you know. Um, let, let him make the money and then come back and, and tell Kanye, yo dude, shut up. <laughs> you know, so there's nothing wrong with money is all I'm saying. But um, you have to be smart, you have to be articulate. Um, I don't respect filmmakers who don't know anything about film or the craft and don't make any effort to improve or get better because that's a static and it gets in the way and it's annoying and yeah, it doesn't matter what I think um, about that person, if you put us next to each other, the outside world is still going to perceive us as the same regardless of the fact that we, we have a whole different history. So uh, as much as I want more people telling stories, I think that people need to be respectful of the craft that they choose to be in. So. And and I'm so sorry. And also going back to, to David's point about, um, you know, that we all do such vastly different things and speak to different aspects of blackness. It's, it's really frustrating because I'm sure, you know, as you've spoken about in like interview contexts, someone will say, what's it like to be a black woman? And it's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can just tell you what I, it's I like. I wonder every day. <laughs> What's it like? You know, I don't know, listen to my music, read some work, see what it's like to be a particular black woman at a particular time in a particular city. Um, and that's that's like what I'm hoping that we move towards. But it, it feels like it can be really disheartening, these very, you know, unthoughtful and kind of condescending questions that, that like, you know, cut into the complex work that we're all trying to do. I feel like that's the thing that really weighs me down. It's feeling like, wow, I just delivered my magnum opus, you know, 45 minute, this LP about my whole entire life, and the, and the only thing you can think to ask me is, what's it like being a black woman <laughs> in, in hip-hop? Like, are you dealing with a lot of misogyny? Tell me about that. Don't speak about your love of video games. Don't speak about, you know, all of these other things. It's, it's just this sort of identity that's, that's placed on you. And that's certainly a part of it, but it seems like it's such a challenge moving out of that. So I'm just, I'm just thankful to have this space and, and I want to, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but um, here, I'm going to come down and be like, uh, Merv Griffin, for those of you older folks in the audience, or Phil Donahue, yes. Yeah. All right, um, hey, Rob McPhee, aka Bodhi Zen, um, Den of Nerds, spoken word artist, 
aspiring comic book writer, uh, comic book store manager. Um, all that being said, um, listening to your panel, first of all, absolutely wonderful. Um, I will definitely be picking your stuff up because the first time I heard you, and I'm always into new music. Um, Jamar, love you. Uh, you're you're love dope. Really bad. Um, <laughs> Dude, like your work is absolutely incredible, inspiring, um, but uh, this is why I say I'm conflicted. One of the things that I loved about when I discovered your writing was I didn't know what you looked like. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about you. All I knew is when I saw your name, I wanted to pick up something and investigate more. Um, and I think as me as an artist and as a writer, um, that's, I guess that's my future utopia, is when I can sit up here and listen to the track and I don't care what you look like because your flow is dope. Um, I love Jamar's work. Um, I wouldn't care what Jamar looked like, you know, if, because it's solid. And I guess that's where the conflict comes in is, are we, are, are we eventually gonna to aspire to be more than just a black writer, a black artist? When will we be finally be writers? When will we finally be artists? You know, and when we just looked at it for the for literally now it's not something like for the content of our of our creation, instead of saying, "Hey, you're you're now representative." Black Panther movie came out. Tell me, tell me your opinion about the Black Panther movie. <laughs> well, they made a movie. Good job. <laughs> I, I haven't made a movie yet, so good job. <laughs> anyway, um, what does your future look like for any of you? Um, as far as being an artist, uh, anyone want to answer that? Uh, well, I I can touch on that a little bit. So I, I'm sure everyone up here uh, and a bunch of you in the audience have some sort of plan in your head or a, a goal that you're trying to reach. Or you know, it would be great if I could get a comic book published. It would be great if I could get my name on a cover of a comic book and go to South Street. And see it, ah, uh, you know, I'd sign it with my metal pen. Um, we all have something that we're trying to reach, and then once you hit that goal, you keep moving to the next one. Uh, really, where I'm at is, and I'm conflicted. My, my, I'm conflicted because I do comic book conventions, I do some book uh, conferences and things like that. And I roll with comic book folks, right? But I don't do a lot of comic books. Um, a lot of the things I've been doing the last 10 years are graphic novels. And, you know, you can throw this up in the air, like, what's the difference? I don't really think there's a difference, but there are people that do. You know, when you go into the library, you don't see floppy issues of Spider-Man there, because they don't, it doesn't work like that. It needs a spy and an ISBN number. And I'm finding more solid ground in book publishing and, and kids lit and in libraries and schools and things like that where the traction of what I'm doing can reach more people. And fortunately or unfortunately I don't really know how to gauge that. You know, I know if I go to a school and there's a bunch of kids that can pull this book up and go, wow, this is great. But they have never been to a comic book store because they don't know where one is in their city or don't have the means to get there. I'm starting to find this track that is going towards book, book books, not comic books. But you know, I still have my heart rooted in here and I'll do projects if they come along. Um, I want comic books to catch up to where book publishing is. And you'll, you're seeing new things, new initiatives happen like Mindforge. They're doing some really interesting things in the book uh, scope. Um, but I know if, if I talk to some of my friends on the floor, they are conflicted too. They're like, oh, you know, I love doing these monthly things, but they're killing me. Like, I'm dying trying to do this stuff. Maybe I should do books. Maybe I should open a restaurant and flip eggs. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what happens next. But I feel like book or lit is kind of where I'm headed. So that's and to, uh, to, 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 for me, and this is just to address sort of what you were, just, a little bit more what you were saying is like, this is just me personally, and you know, W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the double consciousness, right? And so it's like, with Mike, I'm just me. I'm just a writer. You know, with Jamar, he's just a cartoonist. Samus is like the smartest person in the room. He just <laughs> can't even make the music. And it's like, you know, I'm not gonna say, oh, I don't see color or anything like that. But then I, 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 I know there's the way I'd like things to be, and then there's the way things are. 
there's some people who just see me as a comic book writer, or just as a writer, or just as their friend, or someone who talks film. And there's other people who are gonna see me how they see me, and I don't have much control over that. So a lot of it's about me finding peace within myself, and, and sometimes how I define myself, sometimes it depends on the moment, you know, and because that's part, again, that comes, it's not just double consciousness, really, it's triple consciousness and quadruple consciousness and quintuple and all the way up to whatever, you know, whatever that moment takes. And, 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 and otherwise, I'm already crazy, but I'd go crazier if I, if I worried too much about it, you know, so, um, but that's just me, I don't know if anyone else. <coughs> And, and I just tend to quickly and say I completely understand kind of what you're saying in terms of wanting to be judged for the content of your character. And, but I also feel like being black is awesome. <laughs> it's so dope. It's so dope. It's so much fun. I love black Twitter. Like, I love, like, you're so funny and so creative and so interesting and so diverse. It's like the coolest thing. And I feel like we often get caught up in these circle cycles of kind of talking about our pain and, and people right. come to us right. to mine us for our pain. So in, in that regard, I hope what changes is not that we identify as black, but that people see blackness differently, that they understand that it's a part of all of these different, that there are all of these different versions. And, and you know, I, I just, I, I love putting black, Rap or black whatever, black whatever in my in my um, guess, bio, and and I completely I it, it's frustrating to have that be attached to a judgment, have to be attached to a character judgment. But I want to, I just love it. I just love it. I, just love it. I, just love it. <laughs> I can see, like personally, I can see just using the term. I guess for me personally, I can see just using the term black. It's like this beautiful rainbow right. of multi like Like it's it's just it's so huge and so vast. Um, my only concern is when it becomes because I know earlier in in my career, it's like you know it's when I I used to teach years ago. I used to be like, oh, hey, Kwanzaa's coming up. Uh, could you put together a little Kwanzaa something for the kids? Uh, and it's like, oh, okay, I don't celebrate Kwanzaa, but hey, I'm okay. Yeah. Um, or it's, it's Black History Month, hey, could you put together something for the kids? Because you're the most qualified. And it's like, well, it's, it's about, we're in a school, it should be about education. Right. Um, and I think people miss, like, they miss out on the rainbow because it's so easy in today's society to step back and say, well, I'm not that, therefore, because like, the rest of my group, the Den of Nerds, they're waiting to interview Kevin Conroy. I saw this panel, like, I have to come down here. Um, and for the majority of them, um, because they're not black, they're, that's cool, that's you. Go ahead, you go ahead and cover that, and we'll do this. Yeah. Where it should be just as important. Yeah, yeah. but I think, the, if anything, you gotta, all this stuff that's going on, you gotta say there's always change, mm -hmm. and what we're talking about is, you know, we're on the come up, you know, so, I don't know, I mean, how many people here work a job? Right? Yeah. And have, have a, or have encountered a bad boss or manager, but because they have the power, you, you let them fuck up for you. Right? And after they, they were incompetent, but you couldn't speak up at the time, you had to watch them mess everything up, and then you saw how smart you were. And I think the whole country, the whole culture is encountering that right now. People say <laughs> dumb stuff all the time and you just let them do it. And you just have to trust. So, you know, if you talk about fantasy and what films are and imagination and where things come from and the collective, like what can happen in a short period of time just when an idea is shared, like how much stuff that became real, physical stuff that was in Star Trek, you know, so I look at movies all the time, and how many movies where black people got the answer to solve the whole freaking world's problem? Right, the girl with the gifts, uh, you know, um, children, men, there's something, um, even in Black Panther, they keep alluding, well, we, we have the secret, we know this thing. So how, how you can, how white established people can spend millions of dollars to put this stuff in stories, and then we don't take ownership of, we have something special, and we need to freaking protect it, that's crazy to me. Right, and I, I, I refuse at my age to think that um, I have to compromise a part of my identity, whatever 
even if it's attached to struggle or joy or I'm not, I'll, I'll keep, I'll want Marvin Gaye and I'll take the village people and I'll, I'll deal with um, Diana Ross. That's all black, right? And I'll, and I'll dance to whatever. You can keep Debbie Boom, but I'll, you know, on the draft, I, I'm not subverting my identity for somebody else's comfort level or acceptance, especially when subconsciously I'm constantly being reminded that there's something that you have. No, I think we need to take ownership of our power and recognize that we're not all given the opportunity, once we have education, to even share what we know until it's too late. So I think that's what being a bird should be about, not trying to fit into any sort of box. How you doing? Um, my name is Manuel Bedoy. I'm one of the indie publishers upstairs, you know, and uh, I make a comic book series, Black Sands. It's a very, very popular. <laughs> and, you know, I hear this conversation, especially with what he was talking about. Look, like he said, what you're talking about is just fine with the with the identity thing, but I, I, I'm one of those people who are what I would call a publishing anarchist, right? I dominate. I dominate everything I do. I have massive amount of sales, I'm killing it, and people are attacking me when I go to the American Library Association, Lion Ford attacks me, Dark Horse attacks me, and they want me to get their, their, my books into their stuff, and then all of a sudden, Diamond Distribution tells them, oh, the marketing is gonna be too much because 90% of the customers in comic shops are white males. So they're like, hey, I don't know how we can educate them on black Egyptians. And basically what they forced me to do was do everything myself. Right, so then I, this year, this is my second year in business, and I've sold 12,000 issues of my comics. I'm gonna sell it to comic book fans. I sell it to parents across the nation, you know? And, and I'm to the point where I'm like, I'm doing the deal with Walmart, not a comic distributor, you know? Like, I'm like, I'm going to where my customers are, and I can care less about comic shops, and if they all burn down with my success, I have no problem with that, you know? And because I, I get kind of irritated when I go to a comic store and I see all the comic books, a lot of black comic books and stuff, I see them, right? And like 70% of them were written by white people. The black ones, you know? And that drives me nuts. Because I'm like, I know they got at least 5,000 submissions this year from black, from, from black people writing the same dang story, and they're like, nah, I'm gonna give it to Tony. You know, and, and, and you know, I'm just, and it just, it just, it's just wild to me, you know. And that's why I have this kind of mentality where it's like, it's, 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 it's like, you can't make a Holocaust story unless you're Jewish. Period. They ain't gonna let you do it. They don't care how good your story is. You don't got the experience level. You can't tell the story. They ain't gonna fund it. And and I feel like that should be the the, the way. Black cinema, black comics, black anything should be for a good time period, like a large block of time, before other people get put into it. That way we can dominate the, 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 the industry. I feel like we have the opportunity, we just gotta stop trying to force ourselves into the industry that's already established. Comic shops are long gone. You ain't gonna get into comic shops, all of them are owned by, it's just, it's just too much of, you're forcing yourself on, some, on another culture, it's just like, you know, it's like if we went to Japan today and just decided everything they're going to do now is comics and mangas out of the industry. No more manga, period. No mangas. That ain't going to happen. They ain't going to take over their industry with comic books to, um, in, in a year or two years or even ten years. They're established. They're doing mangas, period. You know, and, and if you want to bring Iron Man in, he better have an accent and he better be, <laughs> he better be in a manga, you know. So, so you know, we got to be, we got to be, um, a little bit of anarchists ourselves and make plays and make money. We know it's out there, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree 100%. I still, I, you've been in it for two years? How long have you been in it? 20 years. Yeah, I, this, is my, with, this is my 22nd year. I still have my own self-publishing company. I've existed at the highest level, and you know what? It's no good. <laughs> it's, 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 it's all, you have to find that balance. I want to grab a couple more questions so I know See some hands coming up. We go. We, we're not going to get to everybody, so you swamp us outside. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cameron Robinson. Uh, I'm in Philadelphia. Uh, first off, I want to say that just seeing y'all up here is very inspiring. Like it makes me appreciative, appreciative to see like people of color up here really doing the thing. You know what I mean? Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to say something real quick. 
With you, Jamar, I work at a uh, gallery, an art gallery. I'd love to see if we could possibly get you there because we're trying to get more black folk in there. I'd love that. Uh, Samus, I write for Jump Through the Magazine, which focuses on music and Philly. I want to see if I can get you in there. <laughs> I do video editing, sir. I want to see how I can help you. And David, I definitely want to holler at you about some ideas. <laughs> but anyway, I want to see if you have any questions. Um, just recently, we found out Superman might become Michael B. Jordan. Everybody's like, oh, he'll be Clark Kent, some, some, some. Me, I'm personally not okay with that. I would rather him be Balzad, an actual black Superman, not a black man replacing a white man. I want us to have more agency, more character. And I don't know if that's wrong with me or what's not, but I want to know what your, your take is on it, like being a musician, a filmmaker, an artist, a writer. Like, what, what do you guys do about that? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> uh, it's not going to put any more money in my pocket if Michael B. Jordan plays Superman. So it doesn't, I, I've, I've learned to stop caring about that sort of stuff. And I think we, we worry too much, we put too much importance on our pop culture influence, uh, our, our interest. It's great, I love it, but teachers are still underpaid in this country and there's still people going to bed hungry every night and homelessness is. It's nuts. Like y'all in Philly, you're second only to San Francisco in terms of the homeless problem. And it's like, yeah, okay, if Michael B. Jordan plays Superman, which he won't, it's not going to happen. Um, I'll, I'll go see it, probably, maybe. But I, I just, uh, like, I just stop caring. I, I always ask myself this question Does it affect my pocketbook? Does it affect the money in my bank account? And if the answer is no, I kind of stop worrying about it. That's just me. Um, and I can kind of speak to the, the kind of dynamic around like repurposing a white character because the character that I've taken on, Samus, is, well, in the original game, she's kind of lavender <laughs> um, but later she becomes this like blonde, you know, tall white lady. And I've definitely had a lot of anxiety over, you know, whether it's more important to create my own identity or to kind of infiltrate this other one. But I found that something that's been interesting and that I didn't really, um, like, envision happening is that folks who are in love with Metroid but don't know anything about black feminism now are learning about that by coming to my albums because they saw uh, Samus with my face on it. So I think it's this opportunity to kind of, um, you know, bridge gaps and, and like build community. And I've had folks who are, who are interested in black feminist thought and have no idea what the hell a Metroid even is. But they've listened to the project, have a song about Mae Jemison, the first black woman in outer space. And so people have learned who she is through listening to these raps about this intergalactic bounty hunter. So I definitely, I think point taking, like, let's create our own shit. <laughs> I don't know if I can curse or not, but let's create our own shit. Shit, 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 all right, we, we, we have time for one more, but it's got to be brief. So who's got a brief question? You're like, I don't know. If anything, I'm going to snatch this out of your hand. Appreciate it. Um, real quick, uh, I'll try to be real quick. Um, I, I wrote a, uh, my name's Kevin Patterson. Uh, I wrote what ended up being like the definitive book on race and polyamory, and I've been touring it around all year. Um, and I've got a book coming out next month uh, that's uh, basically queer polyamory superhero story. So I keep getting called into places to speak about race and about like representation. And I do want to claim that identity space as far as polyamory, as far as, uh, as far as being black in polyamorous spaces. But I get called into these spaces so often to talk about the same shit over and over and over. And like a lot of what y'all are telling me, like a lot of what, the, what you're expressing and stuff that I've been going through all year, I've been book touring all year. I want to ask like in that frustration, like how do y'all take care of yourselves? Like how do you, how do you manage yourselves, your body, your your your, your relationships, your person, your personal space, just in this sort of space where you keep getting brought in to talk about That's like another things. Panel, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Someone, please. Yeah, self care is the most important thing. Um, you know, we didn't talk. I'm the wrong person to ask about like you know 
psychological brain stuff and all of that. But I know I'm going to really enjoy this cafe au lait with the cinnamon in it. <laughs> and I'm going to sip it slow and y'all wait until I'm finished with this cafe au lait. Like you take your tiny moments. And that's great that you're touring and you're being asked to speak and do that. Make sure they get you your money. Yes. Right? Yes. And then you make sure you get your travel in. And then, you know what I mean? Like you have to find those little spaces in all of this to take care of yourself. Self care is like the greatest thing. It is. And, 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 and we're going to have to wrap this up in just a moment. So I don't know if anyone else has anything to interject. But what I'll say is that you create your own network of self care, right? So it's like, you know, at the end of the day today, there's some people I'm going to call or text and check in with. And you just, it's your folks. It's your people, right? And, and especially if you're stepping outside of the norm of what blackness is supposed to be, then what you do is, I, I create my own black world, right? And it's, it's the friends that I have, it's the colleagues that I have, who I can just sort of decompress with. And, and we know how to code switch when we need to. So we can be in a public space, and we go, yeah, man, that motherfucker, you, blah, blah, blah. And then we look around and we're like, oh, hey, how was your day today? And, and that's just it. But it is, self-care is really important, because especially, like, you'll find yourself being like, as far as they're concerned, you're the only person who knows this thing, and you're, they expect you to speak for everybody. And you just sort of have to get it out of your head. And, and a lot of times when I'm doing interviews, I'm like, look, I'm not speaking for anyone to be. So like I said with the Michael B. Jordan question, I don't, I don't care. Other people might. I don't care. I'm still waiting for them to do it. When, they, when they're making a movie of one of my characters, Michael B. Jordan might be able to play one or two, you know? <laughs> but I'd rather have Idris Elba, you know, so. Yeah, well, I'll, yeah. I'll get, I'll get so, um, I name drop Jesse Lee Peterson, just, just on the fly, but um, he's, I'm working on a book, it's called, um, I Love Myself Too Much to Hate Black People. But some of y'all niggas. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, you know, so you know, I, I you know, you, being black is a chore, and I, you can't be black all day. You have to, you can't, you have to open your boundaries up and go to Taco Bell. They, they make great Mexican food. I mean, where are you? Um, don't, don't. You can own, you can own yourself, but you don't yeah. have to accept every label that people place on you. And, um, I, you know, I fight, I think, all the time. And then also, anything that you're talking about, think about, it's been said and thought about and talked before. So having a good relationship to the past, and like I said, I spent a lot of time on YouTube. Look at what other people have to say about it. I love the fact that you know, we discovered James Baldwin and had great documentaries. And, you know, any, anything that we're talking about here has been said a hundred times. We're getting the times up, so we're done. But really quick, where can we find you before the weekend's up if you're here at the show? You, Sam, do you have a show tonight? Yes, I'm performing at 715 in the main stage area. You can find all my stuff at Samus Music, S-A-M-M-U-S -S Music, that's Twitter, samusmusic.com, Instagram, wherever. And you can chop it up, chop it up outside too. Um, uh, I'm upstairs, uh, Artist Alley, F10, come see me. I'm just hanging out with David at the table and hanging out with where are you? What's your uh, YouTube channel? At R E E L B L A C K. If you didn't get a button, I'll just come see if I got a bunch of them. And I'm up in the Artist Alley, table E, as in Edward24, also davidfwalker.com. Thanks so much for coming out. Come by our table, talk to us, chop it up. Thank you so much. Can someone get a picture of, uh, of, of all of us together real quick, please?